So our next speaker is uh, very interesting. All of our speakers have been pretty interesting. Um, this is, uh, she's from China. No other country has gone through so much change in such a short time as China. And for no other country reveres education as much as China. I think we all know that, and I as a teacher know that. The Chinese parents are always giving me gifts at Christmas. It's so great. Um, yes, it's really is amazing. So um, our next speaker is going to be talking about how Chinese elite are rethinking education. And I think it might apply not only to the elite, but to all of China, and how they're rethinking education. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Sarah, Sarah Jane Ho. She's principal, sorry, principal of Institute Sarita in China. So thank you for joining us, Sarah. Everybody, close your eyes, a sinner, and go up. Everybody. All right. I think you're all set. Okay, great. Adjusting. Oh. Testing? Okay, I think this is better. Um, okay, hi everybody. Uh, I am Sarah, um, and I, I'm based between Beijing and Shanghai. So to give you a little bit of context about um, why I'm talking to you about this topic today, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do. I'm originally from Hong Kong. I grew up in Hong Kong. When I was 14 years old, I left my international school in Hong Kong, and I went to boarding school in New Hampshire, USA. I went to Phillips Extra Academy. I was one year behind Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and then, unfortunately, I wasn't friends with him then. I should have been. Uh, and then I went to Georgetown University. And I graduated with an English major. Um, and uh, actually, today, I sit on the, on, on, the, on the board of the college of Georgetown University. Um, and then I did a couple of years of investment banking in New York. Um, and then I lived in, the first time I lived in Beijing was in 2009, working, volunteering for a nonprofit before I then went to Harvard Business School. And I graduated from HBS in 2012, and I moved to Beijing. So my nickname in my family is Mainland Girl, because I never go back to Hong Kong now. I'm always in mainland China. Uh, and in 2012, I did um, probably the first of any Harvard Business School person, graduate, uh, to do something like this, I opened an etiquette school. I opened a, sw it was based on a Swiss finishing school concept because I also went to Swiss finishing school. And, um, and I was very inspired to bring this concept to China. Uh, and at that time, my, my father said, well, actually at the time, my Harvard Business School professor said, Sarah Jane, this is very interesting. Um, you should do some market research and you should write a business plan. And they said, by the way, what is a finishing school? Um, and then, and, and then, so I, you know, I was very, I mean, I was a little lost. My dad said, don't bother writing a business plan. In a country like China, even the government is continually uh, revising their government statistics. So there's no point in you doing any market research. Just move over there, and within six months, you'll know if it works out or not. Now, if it doesn't work out, then what's the worst case scenario? You go back to doing nonprofit. So I thought, well, that's true. There's not much of a downside. And so in 2012, I moved to Beijing and I opened Institute Street to my etiquette school. Um, and we were trying to figure out pricing. And, and so um, I didn't know who would end up being our clients, whether it's mothers or kids, because Swiss finishing school usually go when you're a teenager or you're in your 20s. Um, and, but I opened up two courses, one called Hostessing for married women and another one called Debutante for unmarried women. Uh, and it's a 12-day workshop for 16,000 US dollars. And you learn how to be a hostess, how to throw a dinner party, how to pronounce luxury brands correctly. So it's Hermes, not Hermes. And it actually um, was very popular. So I've been doing that for five years, just the etiquette school, day in, day out. And, uh, and, and this year, I was wondering what to do with all the affluent women who were coming through my school, many of whom are businesswomen or wives of businessmen. 30% of them have listed companies in China, and um, most of, they have on average two to three children each. This was before the one-child policy was loosened up, so, um, which loosened up last year. 
And, uh, and, so, and so this year I was thinking what to do with all my clientele who always want to meet with me and discuss their kids' issues and how to get their kids into like, Exeter. And, and so amongst other things as well, business issues or marriage issues. So I decided to create uh, a venture fund. So today I have a $300 million venture fund called Feng Chao Value. And we focus on education, hospitality, and smart home, because one of my partners really likes smart home. Uh, and, and I also have a private members club in Beijing that I just opened last Friday. So, um, and, and through this, these five years in China, there have been a couple of trends that I've noticed. In terms of education and how parents think about their kids' education, China today is where Hong Kong was 15 years ago. So, First, you know, with Hong Kong parents, first parents were sending their kids to Australia to go to boarding school, and then realized that Australia doesn't actually have the best education. And so then they decided to send their kids to Canada. Um, UK had always been a popular track because of Hong Kong being colonized, but then when I started applying to boarding school in 1999, 2000, that was when there was a new trend in Hong Kong, and all the kids wanted to go to the US. And which schools in the US? Phillips Exeter, Phillips Andover, Deerfield, St. Paul's, Hotchkiss, et cetera. And um, my parents, who were very, sort of very UK focused before, um, I mean, in my, for me, it was a way of rebelling to my parents. I wanted to go to the US, so I ended up applying to Exeter. And, um, and now in Beijing and Shanghai now, the, the Chinese elite now, they are exactly going through that trend. So first, they were sending their kids to Australia. Why? Because they had a friend whose other kid was in Australia. So everybody was going to Australia. Um, there's sort of this herd mentality amongst, amongst Chinese. And then now, I'd say about three, three to four years ago, the trend has been massively in favor of the US and the UK is kind of seen as a little outdated. So, um, when I first lived in Beijing in 2009 and I was doing nonprofit, I actually never mentioned that I went to Phillips Exeter. Uh, in, 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 the U, in the US circles, the first thing you do is say, oh, where did you go to prep school? Oh, where did you go to you know, university? And in China, I never mentioned any of it. Um, firstly, because I'm, I, you know, I, I didn't think there was any need to, but secondly, bragging would be kind of pointless because nobody would know what, what the school was, except for Harvard. And so, um, and then, but when, when I moved back in 2012, and a lot of the times now when I go to events, I'll see it bump into a lot of my clients, and a lot of them will bring a huge gaggle of other mothers over, and they'll say, this is Sarah Jane, she graduated. They won't even mention Harvard, they won't mention the etiquette school, they say, she graduated from Phillips Extra Academy. And straight away, everybody's like, oh, how do I get my kid in there? Um, is Andover better, or is Exeter better? So, Within five years, a total change, total change. One thing about Chinese is that they are actually um, very quick to admit that they don't know something um, or that they need to learn something. So Chinese are often picking up new hobbies, learning new things, taking new courses, and same with education. You know, they'll just say, I don't understand anything about the education or what are the good schools in the US. So, you know, I'm, and, and they'll just sit down and milk all information from you or they'll learn from their friends. There's very much a, a, a peer sharing kind of system, especially on social media like WeChat. So, so why are, parent, are Chinese parents trying to send their kids abroad now? Because, you know, the first thing is sending their kids abroad for university. Um, so they're going to US colleges or UK colleges. But now, you know, the trend is also sending them out at the age of 12 or 13 to, first to maybe, you know, a school like Fay School, which is a good middle school, where they can improve their English before they then apply to the top-notch schools, before they then apply to the Ivy Leagues. To understand their perspective, you first have to understand the Chinese educa educational system as it is right now. There's something called and so Gaokao is basically one exam that determines your future. You take it at the age of 17, secondary school, and this one exam determines your whole placement. I mean, where, wherever you go to university. And the grades you previously got in school don't really matter. It's all about the Gaokao. It's extremely stressful, very, very stressful. And 
the only way to escape studying the Gaokao is to, is to study abroad, is to leave. Um, the state education system is also extremely rigid. Uh, I remember when I went to Ex Phillips Exeter, there was a, 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 another classmate who was from mainland China. And um, Phillips Exeter is very much about in class, it's, much, it's, it's almost like a boardroom style. And the teacher said, oh, you know, Steve, what do you think of the book we read last night? And Steve said, teacher, what do you think that I should think? And, and that very much is what the Chinese education system is like. No creation or innovation is encouraged. And in fact, if a, if a student asks a teacher saying, oh, I didn't quite understand that explanation, um, then the this, this student would probably receive a very bad grade from the teacher. And this is just how it's done. So the only way you know, to, to escape that is by either by going on the international school track, which is what a lot of Chinese parents are doing now. So they're sending their children to international schools. Who can go to an international school? Well, only children who carry foreign passports because it's made for the, it's intended for the expats in China, but obviously now a lot of Chinese are getting foreign passports, US passports, European passports, Caribbean passports, and so they are able to then enroll in these international schools, which also sets them on that track to go to usually the US or the UK. The alternative is going to a state school, but in the foreign department. So that's the English speaking language department of the state school. Um, and, then the, and then the third option is to just you know, stay, stay in the local school where it's all Mandarin based and you take the Gaokao. Now, um, one of the biggest challenges that parents often think about for their kids, and it's almost like a, di a dilemma that they, they, they often like to discuss with each other is, do I want my child to go to international school and be primarily English speaking? or and, and in some ways lose touch with the culture and the family and even me, because the parents' generation, they don't speak English. The parents don't speak very little or next to no English. If they're parents from Shanghai, they probably speak a little bit of English. Parents in Beijing, no English. And so when they send their kids to international school, their kids are o primarily operating only in English. And then they go to boarding school and then their Chinese deteriorates. I had, a, I had a client um, at my etiquette school, a mother, and she said, she brought her son to me, and her son had gone from a, a top local school in Beijing, and then at the age of, in, in somewhere in primary school, she took him to Hong Kong and put him in the Singaporean International School so that he could learn English. And then, after a few years, she realized his Chinese was getting worse, so she brought him back to Beijing and put him back in a local school, and then, she realized, well, oh, actually we want to send him abroad. So then she pulled him out again and put him to an international school in Beijing. And she said, Sarah, we really want him to go to Exeter. Um, and, and, I, and I was like, you know, what, I was like, what, is your, what, what was your goal of doing this, of switching your kid around? And she said, she said, Sarah, I don't want my son to just be bilingual. I want him to be bicultural. I want him to pick up Shakespeare and not only read it, but appreciate Shakespeare. At the same time, I want him to be able to pick up Si Yu Ji and appreciate Si Yu Ji. And I thought, wow, you know, I don't think I'm even at that level yet of appreciating Si Yu Ji. Uh, and, and, and so, but you know, it, but now the more that I think about it, even though I don't have kids yet, um, I very much, when I have children, I would also hope that they're able to maintain, you know, these, these two cultures. So this is the biggest dilemma that the Chinese elite are facing right now. Um, so the next generation of parents that you're seeing, because I see, you know, there's sort of this first generation wealth. You have to remember, China only really opened up um, in the in the late 80s, and so the first generation wealth, because before that everybody was a peasant, right? Nobody had any money. I don't know if anybody visited China even in the 90s. My dad used to, we used to have an apartment in Beijing in 1995 and everybody was riding bicycles. We had a family friend who had a car and a driver and we thought he must have been one of the richest men in Beijing. And afterwards he disappeared. Um, but you know, I mean now everybody, everybody has a car and the congestion is terrible. Uh, so, you know, it's, so you have that first generation wealth who are in their 40s, mid, mid early to 40 to 50 years old. And they were doing manufacturing, they were doing industry, real estate, et cetera, working very, very hard. Uh, and then you have the second generation wealth who are their children who are teenagers or who are in their 20s. Um, and, so, and so, you know, this, 
this dilemma where the parents don't speak a lot of English, don't speak any English, children are becoming very, very Western. Um, and the other thing with China is that you know, no other country went through such a short amount of time, such a big amount of change in so short amount of time. You went from total isolation to total globalization. Now every single Michelin chef star rest, uh, chef is in, is in town, um, every single brand is, and it creates a huge amount of pressure, not only on the government in terms of um, congestion, pollution, et cetera, but also on the individual human being. So actually the new trend that Chinese elite want for their kids is to be citizens of the world. Because before the first generation, they wanted them to go to Harvard. They wanted them to, and of course the dream is still to go to Harvard, um, but they wanted them to be getting straight A's. They wanted them to be bookworms. But in doing so, they actually, you know, they lost out on a huge part of their ch child's other education, which is sports, health, hobbies, interests. Now, what the Chinese elite want is they want their kids to be able to ski in Switzerland, like the Swiss, to horse ride in England, like the English. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, what it really is about um, going forwards. A lot of Chinese, they say, they're, they're really focused on two things. One is Guizhu, which means nobility. And the other one is qi zhi. Qi means energy, zhi means quality. There's no direct translation for it, but it, 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 you could, it, it could be interpreted as presence or elegance, sort of as sort of kind of leadership qualities. And this really comes from, what the Chinese are realizing now is this comes from confidence, being healthy, you know, in terms of your body, state, and mind. Um, and also, you know, so now Chinese are starting to take an interest in psychology. So with the Chinese elite, which are very, very different from the rest of other Chinese parents who were just, the rest of the mass Chinese parents are still trying to get their kids into, to even learn basic English, right? So elite Chinese parents are on a really different scale. Um, it's, 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 it's really a reversal um, of educating their kids, a turn away from the Confucian past of only being a bookworm and towards educating the child as a whole. Thank you.